Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Sean McCarroll. I'm going to be your uh, master of ceremonies for this talk today. I wanted to thank everyone for uh, coming to uh, stage four, which is a speaker track of the Career Village for the Diana, Diana Initiative. And uh, so we're going to uh, go ahead and kick the, uh, the get the ball rolling. Uh, yesterday, we had some uh, really good talks in this speaker track uh, from uh, specifically focused on uh, uh, the skills and the experiences that women can provide to the technology in the cybersecurity track. And uh, today, um, Vidya Murthy is going to uh, expand upon that with her unique experiences. And uh, specifically, uh, Vidya uh, studied biology and accounting in uh, college. That's how she got her start. And then uh, based on connections uh, and the, the nice people in the field started a job in security consulting um, and then eventually expanded and uh, evolved into the cybersecurity field over the years. Uh, she completed her uh, MBA uh, from Wharton and then has recently started a, uh, or joined a uh, startup focused on solving healthcare, cybersecurity and uh, pro proactive device-based solutions. Uh, she's the third employee in that, uh, in that uh, that has joined uh, the first non-technical hire. So she has a lot of uh, detailed experience in this uh, particular topic. Uh, quick administrative uh, detail before we pass on to the presenter. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please put it in the comments. Uh, usually Vidya will uh, respond to those uh, as she can get to it during the presentation, but any that are not responded, I'll make sure that uh, she's given the list at the end. And then if there's any free time, we're gonna make sure that those get answered. Uh, other than that, please put your comments and your questions in the uh, comments track. And without any further ado, I'd like to pass it to your presenter for the top topic, Vidya Murthy, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for choosing to spend a moment with me this morning. Um, as mentioned, I am going to be talking about why non-technicals matter. Um, first, as someone who has historically sponsored conferences, I really want to take a moment to thank the folks that are sponsoring this because it does take a lot to make this uh, whole thing operate and make the conference come to life. So thanks to the sponsors as well as to the generous volunteers for their time and effort. So why non-technicals matter? So I remember the very first DEF CON I attended. I was sitting in a tight conference room. It was sweaty. I'd been there for a long time. And there was a group of really prestigious folks up on stage. And someone raised their hand and said, hey, I'm not technical. I've never done coding in my life. How do I break into cybersecurity? And this speaker, whom I'd come to respect throughout their session without missing a beat, said, you got to learn to code. You got to do the time, put in the hard work, and learn to speak the language of the developers. That's how you show value. And as a non-technical person, my heart just broke. I had no intentions of learning how to code. I didn't have the resources available to do that. And it wasn't where my passion lied. And I've often felt, and that moment was no exception, that being non-technical has meant that I didn't belong in cybersecurity. And advice like learn to code didn't crop up just that once. It, it kept showing up as thematically, this is how you break into cybersecurity. And I know it's not malicious and I don't blame anyone, including myself, but by learning to articulate my value, it's helped me get a seat at the table and really prove value to my organization. And that is what I'd like to share with you all today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Vidya Murthy. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at a cybersecurity startup that focuses on medical device security. So one of the things that I'd like to start with is the common perception of what cybersecurity is. I think in media, we often see it depicted as someone wearing a hoodie with multiple monitors, coding in the dark, and really kind of being this highly technical resource. And to an outsider that doesn't have experience in cybersecurity, they might actually think that that is what cybersecurity is. And it's not very appealing if that's not your skill set. But according to a study by Forrest and Sullivan, 30% of all cybersecurity roles are actually not technical. And according to ISC Squared, there's a cybersecurity gap in terms of resources that's evolving to the tune of about 4 million people worldwide. 30% of 4 million people is a lot of non-technical jobs. And so the question becomes, what do these non-technical roles actually entail? 
there's a whole bunch of things and it ranges from governance, risk, compliance to project management, analytics, learning data sciences, technical writing. There are so many functions that fit across an organization that don't require some level of coding. And it can be even privacy regulation and learning law. As we've seen kind of in the last four to 10 years, the notion of privacy has really become front and center. I think that that's a big place for non-technical folks to, to play. So the follow-up question to that is, how do these roles actually fit in the organization? Are they people that are revered? Are they positions that I would aspire to grow within and it'll become more than just an entry-level role? And I think the answer is absolutely. People have been fighting about where does security fit in an organization since the concept of security became acceptable in corporate culture. So I think the relevance that we as non-technicals can bring to the party is that security spans all functions. It doesn't matter what your org chart looks like or where you're placed in an entity. When security can be positioned as being a business enabler, that's where you belong and that's where you're gonna take root successfully. Now it's a common trope in cybersecurity for people to say that uh, people are the weakest link. And I think this is an important note when we talk about non-technical value. Sometimes they often say, hey, people are the weakest link. Up to 40% of data breaches are caused by people. And I think where non-technicals can thrive is by saying, well, is it really that the people are our failures or are we not designing for our people? Maybe we're missing 40% of these human use cases and we don't understand how people use our systems. In the early days of computing, this was probably true, right? We didn't have a lot of knowledge about how to design products securely or how to make environments secure. But since then, we've kind of grown as a community. There are well-established frameworks and lots of advice out there for how to protect people and their devices. And as defenders, we really want to be able to show that what we are doing results in value to our teams. But a lot of times the defenders can sometimes feel like they're on the losing team. And that can often have to do with missing potential threats or missing vulnerabilities that are applicable. So I'd like to do a simple exercise. There's a lot of examples of homogeneity versus diverse teams in various parts of uh, business. One example, which many famously know, is in 2014, Apple launched what they called a comprehensive health tracker. This health tracker allowed for tracking of exercise, what you ate, and even things as random as copper intake. And despite including these niche things like copper intake, Apple failed to include something that would have probably been useful to about half of their user population, period tracking. Now, one asks themselves, how is that possible? And I've come to the conclusion that it's most probable that they had a team that was homogeneous. They lacked the diversity to know what needed to be included in their design. And I think if we carry this analogy over to cybersecurity, we could think about what is our security objective? And are we perhaps missing it when we don't have a diverse team? So let's take the example of trying to design a device that's going to operate in a hospital for 10 to 15 years, and we wanna be able to know when a known vulnerability comes up that applies to that device. So this would be something like OpenSSL is now on version 4.1.1, and what the version is on the device is a couple iterations back and there's a known vulnerability getting exploited in the wild. So imagine we have a homogeneous team, that's all technical resources, and they, don't, uh, they, they try to come up with a solution to this problem. One can imagine that it goes something like this. They come up with a database on how to track all the components in a device, and then they figure out how to match those components with vulnerabilities as they come up, and then they decide to take action once they've identified a match. And in isolation, that sounds like a pretty good approach. You could certainly solve a lot of problems with that strategy. But think of what a diverse team could think about. Now, the context of this, if you caught it in the beginning, was a medical device operating in a hospital. When you have a device attached to a patient, the core thing that a lot of folks may think about is, what is the patient safety impact of this device? So imagine we have a vulnerability and this component on a device is in fact impacted. Well, this more diverse team is perhaps thinking about, well, what happens to this device in the field? Can the patient still be treated? 
can we still provide clinical care to this person? Is it enough of a patient safety risk that we should go down the path of fixing this vulnerability? Or do we contextualize this vulnerability from a technical perspective into the use case of how the device actually operates? I, as someone in the healthcare field, strongly feel that it is far more important to really know the context of where this device is operating and understand, yes, there is a patient at the end of this. And it's no fault of the homogeneous team that they perhaps didn't include that, but it's to the point of there is value when you have a diverse perspective and think about how to solve this. So you may be asking yourself, hey, this is all great in theory, but what about real life? Any given week, you've seen the headlines in the papers, and you know that there are vulnerabilities that are being exploited on an ongoing basis. We've had a solid 20 to 25 years to try to build our defenses as attackers have become more mature. And what we're doing so far doesn't seem to be cutting it. So I think that demonstrates that the model to date perhaps has some flaws to it, and we really need to expand how we think about defending our important resources. So examples I can offer in real life. Um, as I mentioned, I'm in healthcare. And when I looked at the top 40 medical device manufacturers out there, I did a look to say, okay, who is in charge of product security and what is their background? And I can say from my rough study that three out of every 10 device manufacturers uh, don't have a technical background really leading this effort. So how can a non-technical person be in charge of product security? Because there's value that we're bringing to the table and we're able to demonstrate that. And while I love a good anecdote, I think there might be something to studies as well. So I tried to find some additional data. Um, Deloitte did a study back in 2017, and I really love this study for no other reason than it says that they're looking at the diversity of cybersecurity, but it wasn't about diversity how we may often think of it. It was about the changing faces of diversity and the fact that you need different roles to really be successful. So what this study showed is there, there are several trends in place, and two that I wanted to highlight is that job descriptions are moving away from kind of these multi-page, really technical requirements and becoming what they called esoteric. And when I looked into that, it was really just kind of this abstracted way of thinking about a problem. How do you problem solve? How do you approach a situation? They also identified a growing emphasis on the need for expertise in privacy and security. And so it showed that there was this trend towards non-technical requirements that we really needed to show and be able to demonstrate to show value. And I think the fact that these headlines are coming up more and more prevalently mean that kind of the folks that are more on Main Street understand what cybersecurity is, and that percolates into operations. So you now have folks from the board that understand cybersecurity. You have leaders from the management teams that understand cybersecurity. It goes across and people start to understand that there's more than just a traditional background to really find your path forward. So let's recap quickly. We agree that cybersecurity is more than coding and that it requires a variety of skill sets to really be successful. And we've examined the fact that there are groups of same thinkers that can potentially come up with a less than successful and robust strategy for securing something. And we've seen that hiring practices are starting to evolve and they're changing how they're asking for job descriptions and looking for candidates to help support. So what's left? Prioritizing our non-security or non-technical voices. One of the most impactful skills that has worked in my life is the ability to translate cybersecurity risks into business risks. Now I'm not talking about FUD or crying wolf or saying that the sky is falling all the time. I'm talking about a methodical and intentional way to really express the impact of cybersecurity on business. So what does that entail? There are lots of theories out there, but one of the ones that's been very common and well received by folks is this notion of risk based cybersecurity. And what that means is being able to correlate kind of where we prioritize cybersecurity with risks to the business. Now, how does this work in a non technical person's role? Well, it can begin by connecting a cybersecurity practitioner with someone in the business and saying, hey, help me understand what you perceive as value and define as valuable to your organization. 
And it can be connecting folks. It can be identifying what is important. It can be saying, who are the people that are participating in this? What are the systems that are supporting this? And there are studies to support that even just knowing what your priority should be and reallocating your order of operations can prove more successful with no additional budgetary spend. In one instance, they found just reprioritizing existing action items made them seven and a half times more secure across their enterprise. McKinsey offers a, an eight step advice about how to go about building this. And I thought we'd just take this down and, and kind of break it down into what could be valuable. So I went by business function and by kind of main areas that are non-technical to really see what could this include. And so I won't, I won't go box by box, but what I do want to demonstrate is that if the cybersecurity team really connects with the different functions, take a look at what that value could entail and what you could be focusing on. Some ones that I think are motivational is when we can really show that what we are trying to advocate for directly impacts the business. And if that direct impact really changes how the company operates or prioritizes their behavior, that's what sustains it. You want security to no longer be us talking about people being the weakest link. If an entire system can be brought down by a person clicking a phishing email, is it really on that person if an AI ML trained email filter didn't catch it either? I think the answer is no. I think it means that we haven't designed it for the user. So I leave with this notion of what skills can we demonstrate to make ourselves valuable within the organization? And it's not about just being able to, or willing to work really hard. I think it's about the ability to work smarter. And so that means having a methodology and rigorously planning what it is you really want to demonstrate with a logical and analytical approach towards the problem. And some of the things I think we forget in cybersecurity are that we have to have soft skills. If the folks that we're talking to and selling security to don't understand what we're talking about, they're never gonna advocate for continuing the program or enhancing our spend for budget. Excellent presenters and having strong communication skills can go a long way with advocating cybersecurity. Management skills are another great one. What we see with project management is that if we are able to embed cybersecurity requirements into a traditional product development life cycle, then you can say, hey, this is just part of that natural gate and everyone takes security as part of that development framework and it becomes kind of the base of how we build stuff. Um, strategic business acumen is something that I think is really important. Um, more and more cybersecurity is evolving from a technical discipline, as we've mentioned, to a strategic business one. Being able to succeed in comp uh, compelling C-suite colleagues to really understand what we're doing can really go a long way to positioning cybersecurity as an organization-wide priority. And I think one of the things that a good practitioner thrives on is the ability to pursue solving a problem. Being persistent, having that grit and going after new and novel challenges is something that we all need to, to try to strive towards. Um, one of the things I think is uh, a way to demonstrate value is keeping track of kind of new innovation. So paying close attention to developments in the industry, whether that's things like regulatory, uh, like privacy regulations. I'm based in California. There's a new California Consumer Privacy Act or GDPR for our European colleagues. Understanding technologies that are coming about, knowing what new threats are evolving and being proactive and thinking about, hey, how do we shift as the industry continues to shift? I think this is one of those great things about cybersecurity. It's never stagnant as demonstrated by this growing gap of need that we have to, to really become better defenders. Learning the language. Now, I wanna be clear, this is not learning to code. This is merely learning to understand the folks on your technical teams that you will need to be working with. And there's this great post, I'll, I'll share the link as well, where they break down software so it's like food and you can understand kind of how folks go about building the basic blocks of what would otherwise be um, a very technical jargon. So having a basic understanding of the language can prove to be very helpful. And the last thing I'd say is we have to, as a collective, think beyond the assumptions we have of attackers. Uh, imagine often when you download a new app and it takes you through where you should be clicking and how to order something that you're trying to get. More often than not, sometimes we say, hey, why is this button here? That really isn't how we should think about designing this. 
That same notion exists in cybersecurity. Hey, I'm trying to defend my box. I've put my security in such a way that I think makes sense to me. But are we really checking our assumptions and saying, hey, an attacker doesn't have to follow the protocols of how to authenticate to this device. We just need to be able to defend it. Um, and so what I would what I would finish with is um, this notion of bringing more folks into the industry and really starting to demonstrate what your superpower is. So take the time, do some inventory on what your skills are, where your interests lie as a non-technical person, and think about adding that into your organization. Take a look around and see what opportunities exist. Where is there something that isn't going quite right? Where there's failure, there's often opportunity to, to really change how that pursues. Um, I'd also encourage thinking about networking with folks. Diana Initiative is a phenomenal event and a weekend for you to connect with individuals that are in this space and have a lot of learnings to do. Join on Twitter, be on LinkedIn, get involved with the conversation and you'll find I, I'm constantly stupefied by how much brilliance is just laid out on Twitter for, for anyone for the taking. And I guess I'd leave with these parting words of your value is not defined by the criteria on some job description. Your value is going to be where your passion and your ability to show care for your organization really correlate. And I uh, encourage you all to, to continue in the field. We need, we need the help, we need the diversity, and we can only be stronger together. Thank you for the time. Um, I think there's a couple of questions that I saw pop up. So let me, uh, let me go through those. Uh, I love the the imposter. I, I hear you. You're not an imposter. You deserve to be here. It is important. How can we develop? Ah, here's one from Ron. Traditional computer science programs don't cover interpersonal, interpersonal skills. How can they be developed for those who take a traditional technical route? I love that question because it can sometimes be at odds with how um, with how you how you come to think about traditional problems. Um, one of the things I found super helpful is going to something like a Toastmasters. So Toastmasters is a uh, regular practice where folks get together and they practice just standing up and doing public speaking. And it can be about what you're passionate about. It can be about what you had for breakfast. It, it really runs the gamut and it gives you the opportunity to just practice kind of getting yourself up and in an uncomfortable position and kind of just talking for some prolonged period of time. So I, I would encourage looking into an organization like that. And if there isn't one in your local neighborhood, think about starting one in your company because it kind of doesn't matter what your background is. Public speaking is not always comfortable for really anyone. So that there's always gonna be a group that, that's trying to work on that. I, I love that as a question. Um, how do techies learn the language of business? Do you recommend taking business classes? Are there other ways outside of the classroom? Um, I think the idea to be able to translate into business is uh, it's a it's a great question. I think there are some simple tutorials out there that kind of talk about functions. But honestly, I think that the fastest route is find a friend in the organization or the function that you're participating or supporting and say, hey, tell me how you think about risks. What makes you most nervous? So imagine a person who's in charge of the uh, production of on a supply chain line, right? They're the ones who are responsible for actually getting the inventory out. Say, hey, what's what's the thing that keeps you up at night? How do you how do you worry about what your operations are and what you need to do? And then as you kind of uncover that dialogue, I think you'll you'll realize that. I think the the notion of understanding all of business and all the risks is a lot. So pick kind of those specific places where you're operating to start with and then see what interests you and kind of pursue that would be my suggestion. Uh, next one, Sarah, as a non-technical contributor, oh, am I out of town? I see you. <laughs> uh, go ahead and uh, finish a couple more questions. I believe we have it till the half hour. Okay, cool. Uh, as a non-technical contributor, how can I show my value to technical people? Um, really learn learn what it is that drives their value. So if you're talking to a business line that's in charge of making infusion pumps for a medical device manufacturer, figure out what they're most nervous about. Is it a pump falling off the back of a truck? Is it that a pump doesn't fit in um, the hospital? Try to get a sense of what it is that they're stressed about from like a marketing or a revenue bottom line perspective, and then see, start with kind of the, the system people process that support that and see where there's potentially uh, a, something that you could focus on and, and add value there. 
Um, where will I post the link to the article? An excellent question. Uh, let me see if I can post it into the chat right now. While I look for that, anything else? 100% for sure looking for a club, hit me up. Awesome, yes, go for it. I think Toastmasters is really a, a wonderful place to, to start with that. Awesome, so uh, Vidya, I think you uh, answered all the questions. Do you have any parting thoughts you'd like to leave the group? No, only that um, I, it, it's common to feel like we have imposter syndrome and get really jived up over this couple of days that we're all together. Don't let that sentiment go away. Kind of find your tribe, find your people that are gonna support you. And I think if you show your vulnerability to folks, they will be more supportive and always there for you as you kind of go out on your journey in cybersecurity. Awesome. We did have one last question okay. about where you'd be posting the slides. I don't uh, know all of the uh, technical details. You know, I don't know either, but I will find a way to post them and post it on the uh, Slack, if nothing else, for Diana. Awesome. Do you have a Twitter or anything that people can follow? I do. Let me post that in the thing. And then if nothing else, they can reach out to you on Twitter and uh, get your material. Yes, absolutely. I, I'm always happy to, to help with kind of this this path because it can feel like you're alone a lot of times. So any any help that you need, please don't hesitate to hit me up. Well, Vidya, thank you so much for taking your time to talking with us. I think I can speak for everyone who's dialed in that this was uh, very informative. It's great looking at things from uh, multiple angles if you're a techie or to not feel like you're outside if you're uh, a non-technical in this case. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I want to thank everyone else for attending. Uh, as you already said, uh, thank our sponsors and the volunteers at the Diana, Diana Initiative for making this happen, giving a voice. Uh, I do want to say the, that one of the main takeaways I got out of the talk is just how important diversity really is to everything that we do. And this is a cornerstone to it. Uh, so I wanted to thank everyone uh, for this wonderful presentation. Hope you all got out of it as much as I did. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you.